For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who announce the gospel of good things. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray that you would do a special stirring in the hearts of all of us, Lord. I pray that you would move my heart. I pray that you would stir the hearts of men and women, young and old, this morning. Or that we would be impassioned for the things that you're impassioned for. So we offer this time to you. Pray that you would be honored and glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, my name is Walt Nussbaum, and uh, Chris asked me if I would fill in. He had a great time. My understanding is at Disney World for the week. You know, I struggled coming up with a title for the message today. Um, it's actually, for me, I'm not a very creative guy. It's always the hardest part of coming up with putting a message together. And uh, the title I came up with was one that was actually difficult to call because it's so, it so breaks my heart. Uh, I've titled the message, The Disappearing Church. To, to have lived, I, I just turned 50 this year. And to see something that I've loved so much for so many years. You know, I came to faith when I was a senior in high school. And to see something that has impacted my life so much, and, it's, and I've watched its impact in the lives of so many people, slowly erode. It's just been a very painful thing to watch, seeing uh, the impact and the influence of the church and believers has been tough. And Jesus gives us an antidote for that, and I'm, we're going to talk about, the, about that today. It's in Matthew chapter 9. Um, you know, my wife and I were having dinner the week before last at this restaurant, and it was a very slow night. There was literally nobody there at this restaurant. And so we began talking to the server and uh, just asked her, hey, how's it going? She goes, you know, just, just trying to figure things out. Y'all ever been there? <laughs> Drew, you ever try to figure things out? She said, I'm just trying to figure things out. I said, yeah, tell me about it. Oh, I don't know, you know, just... School, no school, work, I don't know. I'm just, just trying to put it together, just trying to figure it out. And we just, Stacey and I just began talking to her. Finally, I asked her, I said, hey, have you ever, I said, did, did you grow up in a kind of faith tradition, like a church or something? And she said, no, I mean, sort of, not really. I said, do you know what, have you ever heard the word gospel? She said, yeah. I said, you know what the gospel is? And she said, well, I, I think so. I said, well, what, do you, what, what do you think it is? And she said, well, I think it just means that we should love each other and, and, and don't steal. <laughs> right? Isn't that what she said? And don't steal. I said, well, I said, you know, gospel means, it means good news. It means good news. And so which means that there's actually news that wasn't good. Do you have any idea what that news might have been that wasn't good? No? Well, the news that wasn't good was that we were all born in this world, separated from God, all longing for something to, to fill us. And, and God came, and the good news is he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this world, that if we believe in him, we can, we can have life. It's the good news. It's the gospel. And it was just foreign to her. I'm like, this is Flower Mound, Texas? Right? This is the Bible Belt and completely foreign. And I just, I remember feeling, how do we get here? How do we get here that that's, that is the gospel? Don't steal. And I felt discouraged. I did. I just felt, ah, this is where we are. What's happening? Y'all ever feel that way? You know, I started thinking, you know, I travel, unfortunately, a lot, and I've been traveling for the last almost 15 years just on planes, and a thought occurred to me, I don't know if this thought has ever occurred to you, 
A thought occurred to me. Do you know that in all of my years of traveling, do you know that nobody has ever shared the gospel with me on an airplane? I mean, I travel two, three days a week. I'm on 130 flights a year. I've never had a single person in an airport, on an airplane, in a restaurant. I've never had anybody, unless they wore white shirts and a tie, <laughs> ever come to me and try to share the gospel with me. Isn't that amazing? Do you think I've never sat next to a Christian on an airplane? I mean, statistics show there's still quite a few of us out there. And I know I've sat next to Christians. I know I've been surrounded by Christians everywhere I go. And yet, I've never had the gospel shared with me, only for the person to find out, hey, hey, brother, yeah, me too, I'm a brother. Yeah, I trusted Christ too. Man, praise God. I've never had to say that. Think about that for yourself. How many times have you been shared the gospel with since you've been a believer? And you've had to say to them, God bless you, thank you, I know him. You know, I was thinking about that, and I was flying out of town this last week, and I was sitting there, and I was just thinking through the message, and God just gave me a little blessing on the plane, just a little just glimpse of, hey, Walt, I got this. And I'm sitting there on the plane, thinking through it, and there's a guy sitting next to me, and usually I'm pretty talkative, but I don't know, I didn't want to talk to him. He's in a suit, young guy, looked pretty, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> and uh, I just wasn't going to talk to him. Um, a flight attendant walks up. She's bringing wa- cups of water to us. and She sets it down on his table, and it spilled all over his nice shoes. Awesome spills, kind of splatters on me a little bit. And it forced he and I now to kind of have to have a brief interaction. And through that spilling of the cup of water, we began talking. And uh, his name's Brennan. Great guy. He was heading to uh, New York City. He's going to get about $100 million from some investors for his company. He's a CEO, 34 years old, successful, great great guy. And as we're talking, he asked me what I do, and I told him, and I do this with companies, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, tell me about your company. Tell me about your company culture. And he says, well, let me just start off by telling you I'm a Christian, and Jesus Christ is the most important person in my life, and I run my company that way. And I looked at him because I was just thinking, nobody talks to me about Jesus. <laughs> Ever. And here's a guy that I didn't want to talk to. You get the irony? And he just drops it on me. I'm a Christian. Jesus Christ is the most important person in my life, and I run my company this way. And I went, me too. <laughs> I know him. And he goes, you do? I said, yes. And we began talking for the rest of the two and a half hours on the plane. And he had a driver picking him up. And he saved me 100 bucks on an Uber ride. And he took me where I'm going. And man, it was awesome. And it was like God gave me this glimpse that there are people out there. There are out there. They are putting it out there. They're engaging the people around them. Just not enough. Right? Just not enough. Matthew 9, let me read the full text. It's not very long, beginning in verse 35. Then Jesus went to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them, because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, it's abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. 
Y'all catch that? That's what I want to talk about today. The, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You know, when I was in seminary, I remember I took a class, a missions class. We had to read a biography. Just pick somebody, a famous missionary, read a biography about their life. And I remember I read the biography of a guy named, he has the greatest last name ever. I wish I had it. I got Nussbaum. <laughs> His last name was C.T. Stud. <laughs> Isn't that great? Who gets a name like that? Stud. Right? And it was apropos for this guy. C.T. Studd. Who's heard of C.T. Studd in here? Got a few people? God. This guy was a wealthy Englishman. Was one of the best cricket players in the world. Went to Cambridge University. This guy had, he was good looking too. He had it all. Got saved. Sold everything. And he said, I'm going to China. And he goes to China. This is in the 1800s. He goes to China, then he goes to India. When it was time for missionary retirement, he said, there's no such thing. He says, I'm going to the Sudan. And he goes and decides to spend the rest of his life building a missions program in Sudan and ends up finally dying at 70 in the Congo. <laughs> right? Let me show you something that he wrote. What a stud. C.T. Studd writes, Believing that further delay would be simple, I'm sorry, sinful, some of God's insignificance and nobodies in particular, but trusting in our omnipotent God, have decided on certain simple lines, according to the book of God, to make a definite attempt to render the evangelization of the world an accomplished fact. Too long have we been waiting for one another to begin. The time for waiting is past. The hour of God has struck. In God's holy name, let us arise and build. We will not build on the sand, but on the bedrock sayings of Christ. And the gates and minions of hell shall not prevail against us. Should such men as we fear before the whole world, I, before the sleepy, lukewarm, faithless, namby-pamby Christian world. What a stud. Namby-pamby Christian world. We will dare to trust our God. We will venture our, our all for Him. We will live and we will die for Him. And we will do it with His joy unspeakable singing aloud in our hearts. We will a thousand times sooner die trusting only in our God than live trusting in man. And when we come to this position, the battle is already won. And the end of the glorious campaign in sight, we will have the real holiness of God, not the sickly stuff of talk and dainty words and pretty thoughts, we will have a genuine holiness, one of daring faith and works for Jesus Christ. How good is that? See, that CT study he goes out and he starts the World Evangelism Conference in Africa, and to this day it's still in existence. And this is a guy whose whole mission was to make sure that he evangelized the world, that everybody would hear the gospel. You know, Acts 1 tells us that it's going to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the outermost parts of the earth. Every one of those concentric circles has people who have never heard, people who don't know. They are in Flower Mount. They are in Denton. They are in Argyle, in Crum. They are all over us, and it is full. The harvest is plenty full. But what's the problem? The problem is that the laborers are few. And they have been called to follow the one who has done everything for us. And yet the complacency, the malaise of complacency just sets in. It's so easy for it to happen. 
If you look here, I want to talk about a couple questions here. We're going to look at three questions today. Number one, the simple question is, why is the harvest plentiful? It's an easy answer. The text tells us. First of all, the harvest, just to let you know, is often defined in Scripture as the sorting out of souls. There is the redeemed and the unredeemed, the saved and the lost, the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the chafe. See, the harvest is the winnowing of that, it's the gathering. So why is the harvest plentiful? Because it's the Lord's harvest. He is the one that has done the work to prepare the harvest. All he needs now are the laborers. Aren't you glad you don't have to do the work to prepare the hearts of men? Y'all ever tried that, by the way? Y'all ever tried to prepare the hearts of men? You're saying it, you're saying it as good as you've ever said it, and it's, it's, it just it's, rings hollow. It's empty. I know people that I'm talking to that I have spent so much time just trying to shape and mold the heart, and I can't do it. The one who does all the work for us is the king. He's the Lord of the harvest. He's the one that prepares it for us. And all he asks for are laborers. So he's the Lord of the harvest. That's why it's full. Why are the laborers few? See, that's the real question. I think there's a few reasons. Number one, I think the laborers are few because I think that the laborers are timid, are timid. I have to confess to you, as much as I try to be faithful and bold in talking to the Lord with my Uber drivers and stuff, I failed this week. I had such an opportunity this week, and I failed. I was on an airplane flying back from New York. What do you do? He tells me he's the director of a movement that's very popular. He's the director of the LGBTQ community for a very large company. He does all of the PR work for this company, travels coast to coast. It's like, wow, tell me about that. Well, and he begins to tell me all about it. This is a three-hour and 20-minute flight. I've got a lot of time to muster up courage. And he opens up his laptop, and he's scrolling through all the, this, his world, all of his world. And I could, just, I could just feel in my heart the Lord saying, Say something. Speak. Don't be timid. I'm telling you, I wrestled, I battled it. And I was saying, no, he doesn't care. He'll, he'll never listen. It's not going to go anywhere. It's a three-hour flight. I've got to sit next to him three hours. If it doesn't go well, it's going to be really uncomfortable. And I could just hear, literally, I, I, could, I could sense it just in my heart and in my spirit. God was saying, speak up. He doesn't hear it from you. Who's he going to hear it from? And we landed. I said nothing. God's still God. God can still get people in his path. God can still do what he needs to do. What he needed was a laborer. He needed a laborer. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. It's painful when you know it's so obvious. Y'all ever had that? You ever had that moment that you knew it was obvious? And you hear that still small voice deep inside saying, speak up. Say something. And you just, you battle it sometimes. 2 Timothy says, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. See, that's what I pray. I pray that God would stir in me a boldness, not episodically, but just consistently that I would be bold. Because I want to be a laborer. I want to be a laborer. Reason number two. God's 
laborers often lack the same compassion that Jesus had. If you look back in Matthew 9, you'll see that what motivated Jesus was that he had compassion for the people. That word, it's a great little word in Greek. Splanknitsomai. Gotta love Greek. Splank, you're gonna spit if you say it, so don't say it in front of somebody too much. Splanknitsobai. It's the word that means one's inner organs. It's that, it's it's the visceral part. Jesus felt viscerally for the people. And out of that compassion, that love, he serves the people because he knows that his father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And because Jesus loves what his father loves, what does Jesus do? Jesus does what his father loves for him to do. See, we must pray for that. We must pray for a deep compassion deep in our hearts. You know, when you love somebody, you seek to love what they love. Yeah, I, I, again, I think, I think of Stacy since I've known Stacy, I've now loved some things I've never loved before. I love guacamole now. <laughs> I hated guacamole. Now I love it. Uh, I actually now love fried pickles. I hate pickles, but, now, but I love fried pickles. I hated running. I love running now. I hated cycling. I actually never did it. Now I love cycling when we go cycling. You know what she wanted me to do? She wanted for two years, she's been like, can we go do CrossFit? I'm like, no. <laughs> no. Are you kidding me? Always raising the bar. No, no, no. Finally, we did it. Six weeks ago, we started CrossFit. Our coaches are right here. I remember the first day we were there. Even Josh came one time. We all looked at each other. We saw three of each other. Just saw images of Jesus. It was, we're looking at each other like, what in the world are we doing here? This is crazy. You know why I was there? Because I seek to love what she loves. She's like, isn't this great? Yes. Yes. Now, the reason I walked in that day, and I love it now, but the reason I walked in, I sort of love it, but the reason I walked in that day it's because she loved it. See, and that's what you do, is that when you love what God loves, you pursue what he pursues. Isn't that right? He has compassion for the lost. He had compassion for them because they were weary and worn out. See, that's why the harvest is ready. We live in a, in a world where people are wearied and worn out. And they're ready for a laborer to come and proclaim the good tidings, the good news, the gospel to them. The rest is in your midst. Peace and joy is in your midst. And you don't have to labor the way the world labors. You can have rest in this world. Third reason. God's laborers often lack the training. I think that's a big reason. I think a lot of times we're not quite sure what to say, how to say it. And so as a result of that, we just don't know how to engage. You know, if you look at, uh, if you want to, if I can give you a crash course real fast in about 90 seconds. You know, the Apostle Paul, if you, if you want to know the greatest model for evangel talks to, Look at the Apostle Paul. He's got so many things he does and so many people that he talks to. But if you really look at his life, the Apostle Paul basically gives five regular consistent reasons for why people should consider Jesus. Did you know that? Five things he does when you, watch, when you read his work, when you watch him speak and preach and engage people, there's five things he does. These five things, we as a church, brothers and sisters, these five things we should all have some facility with. The first thing he does is the Apostle Paul talks about his testimony. He knows how to share his testimony. Do you know how to take your story 
And do you know how to tell your story in such a way that you can show somebody how God has changed your life through Jesus Christ, your testimony? The second thing Paul talks about is he talks about that only through God alone, through Christ, can one's sins be forgiven. That's the second reason. Paul talks about it all the time. That we get to go from the domain of darkness to the domain of God's own Son. He forgives us our sins. The third thing he talks about is he talks about the prophets, how they foretold of the coming of the Messiah. And Paul is a master of doing that, a master of showing how Jesus is the fulfillment of all that was to come. It's one reason why I love listening to Chris Wilson. He loves to bridge the gap between old and new. See, to be able to show people the the foretelling of the Messiah, that he was to come hundreds of years in advance, and then to see this picture of Christ matches perfectly the anticipation of what the prophets foretold. Fourth thing he does is he talks about the impact that Christ has made on communities and on groups in the world. In Acts 26, in fact, he says, he says, for these things have not been done in a corner. Paul is talking about the fact that through the transformation of Jesus Christ, you see whole peoples being set free. You have an entire book, the book of Philemon, that was written, challenging a Christian slave owner to set his, his slave free. See? And Paul says, we are a public witness to the world. We're not some private secret club. We are public. All you have to do is look throughout the world and see the impact that Christianity has made. If you want a wonderful book to read, Jeremiah Johnson. He wrote a book called... uh, I knew that would happen. (laughs) Just Google Jeremiah Johnson. He only wrote one book. He's a... Oh, what's it called? Unimaginable. Thank you, Matt. It's called Unimaginable. It's about 150 pages. There's no pictures. <laughs> but it's really good. And he'll walk you through the entire impact of Christianity throughout history. It's powerful. That's what Paul talks about. You know what else he talks about? He talks about the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, he said, if Christ be not raised from the dead, our faith is what? Remember? Is in vain. The entire faith stands or falls on the historical veracity of the resurrection. That's it. Those are those five things. His testimony, the forgiveness of sins, talks about the prophet's foretelling of the Messiah. He talks about the impact of Christ on whole communities and throughout the world now. And he talks about the power of the resurrection. Those five things, if we as a believing community could have some facility with that and engaging and and talking to people. We would have the ample tools to communicate to people the power of what Christ can do in one's life. Matthew says this, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, right? Go on into all the nations, baptizing. But the key phrase there is making disciples. And part of making disciples is the idea of being trained. Ask yourself an honest question. Have you been trained? Have you reached out to somebody and said, can you help teach me? I want to learn more. Can you show me how to share my faith? Basic skills so that I can be an effective laborer. That's part of what it means to go out and not just proclaim the good news, but to make disciples and train. I have to be one who has been discipled who has reached out and, 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 and asked somebody for help and for assistance. Finally, the third question is this. What can I do to be a more effective laborer? What can I do to be a more effective laborer? I think, number one, we have to begin with actively praying that God would bring opportunities our way. We have to appeal to the Spirit of God. You have to be able to say, Lord, this week, bring somebody in my path. Lord, my next door neighbor, I've been living next to them for six years. Give me an opportunity to talk with them. Give me an opportunity to share my faith with them. Lord, give me 
somebody this week to cross my path. And then keep your eyes open and watch and wait. I remember, I remember one night, my, my son Cooper and I, we were praying one night. And I used to, every summer, I would, I would try to do this thing where I would try to fix somebody's air conditioner in the hot summer and I would just sometime during the summer wait for somebody's windows who are rolled down and they're sweating. It's 103 degrees and the Texas heat. And maybe they had a kid in the back seat sweating bullets back there. And you know their AC is out. And I would, for a few years, I would say one of my ministries every summer was to offer to them, I'd like to fix your air conditioner. And one night my son and I, we were, Cooper and I were praying. And I said, Cooper, we're going to pray that God would bring somebody to us that needs their air conditioner fixed. Okay, Dad. Lord, in the name of Jesus, pray that you bring somebody to us. Next day, Cooper and I, we go to Starbucks, right over here at the Loop. We're sitting there, and we're doing his reading and his just basic reading that summer, which he didn't want to do. And, and all of a sudden, this guy walks in. And he's a guy that went to high school with me. I hadn't seen him in 20-some-odd years. He walks in, he sees me, he kind of puts his hand up. I put my hand up. He goes up, gets him a big old venti ice water. And he comes around and he comes over to our table. Hey, Walter. He tells me, reminds me of his name. Yeah, good to see you. I said, what are you doing? He goes, oh, my wife's across the street. She's over there at a Weight Watchers thing. And I've got to go find an air conditioner for my van. I went, oh, really? He goes, yeah, I went out. Man, it's so hot, so... I'm going to go out to a junkyard and find kind of a, and I'm going to put it in. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, hey, well, good to see you, man. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm up here preaching today, to be honest with you. <laughs> and he walks out, and Cooper goes, Dad. I went, what? He goes, the, the prayer. <laughs> what, what prayer? Dad, you prayed last night that God would show us somebody to fix. Oh, my God, you're right. And I literally, I literally jumped up out of the seat. I said, stay here. I jumped up. He had already crossed the loop, and I'm yelling his name across the loop. He turns back. I go, hang on. And I get in my car, and I drive over there, and I said, you, you're going to go get an air conditioner? He said, yeah, I'm going to go to a job. I said, you got a few minutes? He goes, yeah. I said, follow me. And I took him over to that Bank of America over there, and I said, how, how much is it going to cost you? He goes, oh, I don't know. I said, just follow me. And I went there, and I pulsed, and I just handed him the money. I said, hey, go get your air conditioner fixed. He couldn't believe it. He was stunned. He started calling me every week for more stuff after that. <laughs> no lie. <laughs> Finally blocked him. I'm like, Lord, come on. I just... I just said one air conditioner is all I wanted to do. After the third time I gave him, I'm like, all right, I'm done. I'm done with this. Isn't that funny? Look, you pray. You pray. Lord, bring them. Show me somebody. Number two, we've got to grow the softness of our hearts for the lost. Ready? By dwelling on what? And how much the Lord has done for you. He who has been forgiven much, what? Loves much. When you can begin looking at your life, look, when I look at my life and I look at what God has had to do to forgive me and to show me grace and to cover me with his mercy and to restore my life, my love for him today so far exceeds the love I've ever had from him in my life to watch what he's done for me, see? And that's why, honestly, that's why when I travel, I seek to have a heart for those around me so imperfect still. Boy, do I need courage. Boy, do I need to fight timidity sometimes. But I love the people around me. Lastly, we must be deliberate each week, deliberate. It can't simply be passive. You have to really challenge yourself. You have to say, I'm going to speak up once this week. 
I'm going to make a conversation with somebody this week that is on my heart. I'm going to have lunch with so-and-so this week. I'm going to build a relationship intentionally with this person this week. And you've got to be deliberate and intentional. We can't be so spiritual. We just wait for God to drop it in our lap every time. He wants us to be deliberate. Proverbs says, prepare your horse for battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. God gets the victory, but he wants us to prepare. He wants us to do the work and be deliberate in our activity. Isn't that right? He wants us to be deliberate. C.T. Studd, read you a poem. I remember when I studied him. I love this poem. I hadn't seen this poem in years, but I remember I ran across it when I read his biography. He wrote a poem called, Only One Life Twill Soon Be Passed. I didn't even know twill was a word. <laughs> Only one life twill soon be passed. Listen to this. Two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears, each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn. And from the world now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say it was worth it all. Only one, one life, twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will, la will last. And when I am dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. That's our pursuit. That is the call of the laborer. Every day to get up and labor for him and to begin reaching out to those who don't even know what the gospel is. They're all around us. The harvest is plentiful. They're across the street. They're at work. They're all around us. And if we as a church, benchmark Bible church, as we move into this new phase of what God is doing in us. If we could be more deliberate and intentional as laborers for God and doing His work, there is, it is unimaginable what we could do in the city of Denton and beyond.